Good. Hello. Where do you uh, where would you like the setup? Um, if like this angle over there, probably th this angle to complement the camera. So it goes from the right side to the other one. Thing. You may sit here and place camera so that you control what is going on. All right. But I trust your sense of how to say. Artistic sense. Artistic sense. I don't think anybody's ever accused me of having artistic sense before. <laughs> Magnification big enough, or it should be a little bigger. That's great. I, I mean, yeah, when when it catches both uh, speaker and the content. I can read it. You can. Then, then we need to re redesign it because uh, people will walk to the stage from this side. Uh, I don't think it'll. I think it'll probably be fine. But just we need to up. recharge it. Oh, okay. Yeah. One can put it from this angle, then, but then it will. The screen will not be visible.
had a laziness attack to myself last night. I was play, uh, planning to help and instruct on putting orbitals on the top and the bottom. Oh, yeah. But then okay. I decided, ah, no. Yeah, <laughs> I, I thought about it too. I didn't want to. <laughs> It would take maybe three minutes more, but I was on the like, okay, okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> Enough for today. I was going to say I had the same problem because I kept changing things. And I figured this would just be a slippery slope. So I got to stop the uh, Yes, because we don't have key. It's unlocked. You may check. Let me double check. Yeah, it's unlocked. Then trash can be removed. So yesterday, or oh, on Tuesday night, I was up until like 2 a.m. watching the election. So then I was like, I need to get to bed. So I sent it to you, and I immediately went to sleep. So then I saw it, and I was like, oh, no. Whoopsies. <laughs> so I just made it. Good, good. And I decided, OK, for a person who did a uh, good talk on the Mm, second year, <laughs> the requirements should be above, and uh, cr critique should be hard. I I I printed the uh, important page, so if anyone asks about Asla and strength, you show this tiny script. And look here. <laughs> I, I I can write it on the board. Oh, then we need to turn camera if we want it. Okay, well, do whatever is needed. But are we using that camera? No, we are using this camera. So then if you t uh, if you check the direction of a camera several times, oh, then this has try to it. Move. it is okay, but there is a chance to of failure. We yeah. did it uh, when we met first time, oh. and then the recording was inactive. I guess I could always just watch it to the screen and be like, "This is it." I guess I just figured that light to matter interaction would include the overlap. Oh, well, that's what I Okay. How to get past this? Well. putting together schedule. Last times the numbers were off, it was like going backwards in time. Now I labeled uh, 12 a.m. <laughs> Midnight. <Yes>. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> then I asked Amy to advertise it to the department. <laughs> I saw it. <laughs> I just looked at the numbers this time. This is why the 24 hour clock is so much nicer. Or just don't put it. And if someone's here at half past midnight. Okay. <laughs> I think Whitney has enough time to. <laughs> um, you have enough time. I did, I did a little They're all mistake in the schedule, and uh, it shows AM instead of PM. Ah. And from your talk to the next talk, there is a gap of 12 hours. <laughs> <laughs> so you can speak. Oh, God. 
Oh, it's sad. The water you can't do coordination. Well, that's because by default they consider it a saturated molecule, right? Those are anyway. Okay. Uh, it will be great if we will get uh, some guests, but even if well, we already have one guest. <coughs> yes. Um, it is lecture number 23 in the computational chemistry course. Uh, we do have, as usual, the biggest possible challenge is to match time schedule. You all accumulated so much um, knowledge and information, and you are so eager to share it that it is very difficult to fit into three, four, maximum five minutes presentation. So please watch time. If you will go longer than assigned, I will just come up and uh, stop. So try, try to speed up. The idea is that we do have one minute to come, one minute to leave, three minutes presentation, three minutes uh, questions. But it can be modified um, a little bit for the like four minutes presentation, two min minutes questions. For the visitors who are very welcome, for the visitors, uh, you are very welcome to ask questions and support scientific discussion, but please uh, make note that we are on a tough schedule. Each talk is like three, four minutes and questions no more than two minutes. Otherwise, other, if you fail the schedule, we will be kicked out and the last speakers will have no chance to present. So we, have, we are living a tough life. Um, this is a computational chemistry course. The goal is to provide students in uh, engineering, math, chemistry, physics, with practical skills to model, to characterize materials. The course is composed of three main components. Theoretical background, practical skills, and scientific communication. As you see, today we will practice scientific communications, presenting our practical skills. Before, we learned different pieces of software, but now we are focusing on a specific piece of software named Vienna Ab Initio Simulation Package, which is designed to model not only chemical systems, but chemical systems interfacing solid surfaces, liquids, gases. And um, upon completion of this uh, set of presentations and accumulating these skills, um, we are going to try to apply those to modeling realistic materials and predict several observables, such as chemical stability, magnetization, band gap energy, absorption, photoluminescence, spectra, uh, and uh, reaction barrier for bond breaking and formation. So with this session, with this piece of software, we are trying to go further than we did with other pieces of software, because we are having at least three new challenges that will be addressed by each of presenters from uh, different angles. So first, periodicity. If we depart from isolated chemical mo molecule to periodic models, there are specifics for periodicity. Second, spin multiplicity. If you depart from singlet closed shell molecules, th one needs to uh, make special arrangements for spin. And third, if there are chemical reactions that we are interested in, we need to have tools to track bond breaking and formation. With this, I would like to bring your attention to the schedule, which consists of 10 talks. We will try to follow the schedule. And uh, the today meeting completes fourth chapter in the course. There will be last third chapter. There will be a fourth chapter also finished with presentations. And uh, I would like to bring your attention to the fact <coughs> that your presentations are placed here. They are numbered according to the order, first, second, third, and they have name of the presenter, name of the presenter um, in the name. So first, second, third, so you will be able to navigate. So I'm opening the first one, uh, bringing it and you will be seeing the title page, but then you will see your own title page. 
Okay? So with this, I would like to invite H.M. Faisal Nasrova to give an opening talk on the input that one needs to communicate to the VASP, VASP software to make it running. For yours, please be short. So here's keyboard, mouse, screen, point on, on the Thank you. <coughs> Hi everyone, good afternoon. This is HM Nasrullah Faisal. Today I'm going to talk about the goals and responsibilities of DFT and preparation of input files for PA for BASP. <coughs> Actually, Density functional theory abbreviated as TFT uses the electron density to find the energy of a molecule instead of wave function. Actually, it is one of the newest ability methods and it has become popular due to less intensive calculation. It was originated from the theorem by Hohenberg and Cohn, but the original theorem was used for the ground state electronic energy of a molecule. The practical application of TFT was developed by the Cohn and Sham. In DFT, the electron density is actually expressed as a linear combination of basis function known as Consham orbitals. A determinant is formed from these orbitals which is used to compute the electron density. The Consham orbitals are not mathematically equivalent to Hartree-Fock ones. A whole list of density functionals are used as the exact density functional is unknown and these functionals are developed either from quantum mechanics or by parameterizing function. In density functional theory, the integrals for Coulomb prevention is needed to be done over the electron density, which is scaled as n cube. In case of Hartree Fock, this is scaled as n4, that's why the density functional calculation is <coughs> quicker than the Hartree Fock calculation. Density functions can be broken into several classes and the simplest one is the local density approximation. For high spin systems, it is known as the local in spin density approximation and it is widely used for the band structures. The accuracy of the DFT can be poor to fairly good depending upon your choice of density functional and your choice of basis sets. For organic molecules, the B3 LYP hybrid potential with 631G basis set is most popular because of its effectiveness, but the accuracy and effectiveness of DFT is not very good for the heavy elements, the charge system, and the systems that are sensitive to electron correlation. Now the VASP. The Vienna Ebenezer simulation package is a computer program to, uh, <coughs> to uh, computer program for atomic scale materials modeling like electronic structure calculation. It computes an approximate solution by using DFT or Hartree 4 or by combination of both. In DSP, the one electron orbital, the charged den the charge density, and the uh, local potential are expressed in plane wave basis sets. The interaction between the electrons and ions are represented either by pseudo potential or the by the projector augmented wave method. Now the most important input files for BSP are POSCAR, POTCAR, INCAR, and K points file. The POSCAR file it contains the lattice geometry and ionic positions. Sometimes it also contains the starting velocities for an MD run. The POTCAR file it contains the pseudo potential for each atomic species that comprise the molecule. The, for the K points file, this contains the coordinates and where's or the mirror size for creating the K point grid. And the INCAR file, actually, it is the central input file for the VASP. It determines what to do and how to do it. So that's our structure. There's the cyclohexan structure. We made it in Gaussian and then Hart and optimized by Hartree Fock. Now, if we need to make the POSCAR file, POSCAR input file, we need to convert this Gaussian structure into XYZ file. And that's why we convert this Gaussian uh, Hartree Fock file into the XYZ file and then we <coughs> convert this XYZ file into POSCAR file. If we need to edit this POSCAR file, we type the nano POSCAR and then we will get this file and we will remove the unexpected lines from it and we will make a clear one like that. Now we need to rotate the XYZ as we need to align E it according to a <coughs> required orientation with respect to xyz axis and then we need 
put the angle of rotation around x, y, and z. As a result, an intermediate postcard rod tint x, y, z will be created. Now we need to define the periodic lattice vectors and we need to put the uh, lattice correction on, uh, on the x, y, and z axis and then we submitted the our postcard file. Then we need to <laughs> make the incar file. There's the incar geometry optimization. And if we type the nano incar, we will get those different modules that control this operation. In this case, as it is a single point charge calculation, we, we change the NSW from 150 to zero like that and then save it. Now the K points file, for the K points file, we will write this code CP being K points and it's done. And the last one is the pot card file. It is the potentials of each atom and we need to, for, we need to put it, we need to write this code. And in this case, these are the atoms that comprise the molecule and that will be ordered according to the alphabetical order. Now we do have now all the files. If we put it in, <coughs> we can look the podcast, K points, Incar and postcard, and now we can run our VSP and that's it. Okay, well, thanks Faisal. <laughs> so, uh, any questions to uh, whatever he presented? Please. So do you use uh, serial version or parallel version of fast? So if you use parallel version, how many processors? is the optimal number for your calculation. <laughs> the larger the better. Just totally. <laughs> how, how many processors do you usually use? Eight, 16, 100? <laughs> no? <laughs> it's actually four, actually. Mm? Four. Four? Only four. Yeah. And I, I use a small system. Small. This. It's a very small system. Yes. More questions? <clears throat> so you, you said that heavy elements were not, or were not DFT friendly. How heavy? Are we talking uranium, iron, potassium? What, how, how big, how far down the periodic table is, is DFT still useful? I think the heavier ones like that you, you taught uranium or titanium that heavy ones maybe. Okay, more, more questions? Um, you gave practical steps how to prepare input file for positions. If you do not use periodic models, if you use chemical models, what are the good values for this periodicity uh, adjustments? <coughs> Approximately. Oh, Here? Mm -hmm. mm. Zero, zero, zero. Mm -hmm. mm. Just what, what are you showing here? How much vacuum do you add to simulation cell? <coughs> In the... Uh, in which units are those numbers? There's are the lattice corrections. Yes, in which units? Angstroms. Good, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> nice uh, presentation answering questions. And with this, let me invite uh, next speaker to the stage, which will be... Tivan, Nakasinha, and Mindika. <laughs> So uh, next speakers, please try to approach and set up your presentation while we are going through a uh, session. And uh, just one more announcement. One of the side goals of this session is that one person becomes expert in one aspect, another in another aspect, and then we communicate, so to say, verbal manual how to operate this software. So it is not just to show how uh, nice I know about it. but. It is a little teaching assignment, communi communicating skills. Okay, with this, Chivan Mindika Nakasinkyo, PhD candidate in the surface chemistry, will present which output VASP software is providing. Four zeros. Okay, good afternoon, everyone.
so during my presentation uh, i am going to show you uh, how to extract some important information contained in uh, wasp output files and also how to visualize uh, so called consham mobiles so as faisal uh, discussed earlier uh, we can run a wasp job using uh, this set of input files uh, this postcar podcar uh, inca and kpoints file and if we run a wasp job using this uh, set of input files uh, a set of output uh, files will be generated like this so if we generate uh, this set of input files this will contain uh, unique pieces of important information so uh, for example uh, this contca file contain updated geometry data Um, such as uh, lattice points, uh, Bravais matrices, uh, ionic positions, etc. And these wave car files contain the important wave function informations, uh, and wave function coefficients. Uh, OC car file contain uh, short summary of the results. So we can use this con car, charge car, and wave car files in continu continuation jobs such as molecular dynamics uh, calculations. So, so in in my part, I'm going to. Uh, exp uh, so using outca file we can extract some important essential information uh, such uh, for a particular system such as uh, total energy uh, band energies home volume energies etc so using an example uh, output uh, output file uh, for titanium hydroxide uh, which was uh, optimize uh, which was uh, which uh, with a single point optimization uh, i'm going to explain how to extract total energy and uh, band energies uh, for this particular system so if you want to extract total energy of this system uh, we if you have the outca file we can use this command line uh, with the command grep and this uh, keyword free energy we can extract the total energy with this command line so in uh, it will be uh, it will give the total energy in electron volts so if you want to extract a number of bands of this system system which will be a uh, important input in lot of uh, calculations or lot of uh, a lot of calculations uh, we can find out the number of bands in the system using <coughs> this command line uh, grep and the n bands comma uh, keyword with this outca file we can generate the number of uh, bands in the system and if we uh, if we can uh, generate the band energies we can find the band energies of this particular system using this uh, command line grep and this this is the number of bands in this particular system and the keyword band energies and our outca file so uh, this will be the output so if we know the band energies uh, we can find out the highest occupied molecular orbital and the lowest un unoccupied molecular orbital so here you can see the band number uh, band energies and the occupation so if we know the energy of the highest occupied then lowest unoccupied molecular orbital we can find out the band gap uh, in electron volts so these are some essential information which we need to know about a molecule so now i am going to explain uh, briefly about how to visualize uh, consham orbitals using uh, consham orbitals using this wasp output data so consham orbitals uh, <coughs> is an analog of uh, molecular orbitals in gaussian so in den density functional theory uh, consham orbitals are defined as some set of auxiliary quantities which can be used to uh, calculate uh, total charge densities uh, and the total energy so this relationship shows uh, how to use so here we here you can uh, see the relationship between the total density and the consham orbitals so if we know the consham orbitals we can determine the density and if we know the total density we can determine the total energy uh, because total energy is we can represent the total energy as a functional of the density so to visualize to visualize consham orbitals first we have to generate this consham orbitals so to generate this consham orbitals we can use set of uh, in, we have to use set of input files we can use the output files of uh, the optimization job so here the uh, positions we can use the positions of this output uh, uh, contca file as the postca file of this uh, input uh, uh, as the uh, input file and then uh, we can use the same k point and the potentials for this calculation and also we can use the wave car file from this uh, output file uh, of the optimization job and we have to import uh, we can import the necessary inca 
template uh, the uh, which was necess which is necessary to run this particular calculation job so we have to Im import this we can import this in car template and we can modify this template according to our system so in this case i am doing uh, optimization of the titanium hydroxide molecule so uh, which has uh, so this is the in car template I have to modify this according to the uh, according to this molecule here I have 24 bands in this molecule so I have to modify this and uh, I have to modify this uh, part in uh, energy interval which will be which is characteristic to the num uh, band energies of this molecule so after modifying this in car file we have all the necessary input files so that we can run the run this calculation so it will generate uh, this output data so here you can see these partial partial charge densities which are the cone charm orbitals for each and every orbital in this molecule so if we uh, since we have these partial charge densities of the cone charm orbitals we can visualize these orbitals using any kind of software like gauss weave or wasp weave so here i am going to show you uh, the uh, how to visualize this using wasp weave so i'm i'm going to see uh, visualize the molecular orbital highest occupied molecular orbital of this uh, titanium hydroxide molecule using wasp weave so this is the wasp weave data weaver window so we can open this uh, molecular orbital uh, highest occupied molecular orbital of this uh, titanium hydroxide using this wasp weave software and then we can uh, customize this window uh, using these tabs data atoms bounds weave and options tab uh, to obtain a nice uh, image of this molecular orbital so that's all i have thank you okay let's thank uh, and floor is open for uh, paper is open for discussion any questions to tivan That's a good comment. I mean, um, instead of using uh, Vastview, you can use Vesta. I think Vesta is also quite good to visit. Vesta? V E S T A. Oh, okay. okay. It's free, free <laughs> software. It's very similar to uh, Crystal Maker or something. <laughs> and it's free. Um, okay. And it's uh, for visualization. It looks really good. Okay. Yeah. Can you directly visualize uh, using the Vastview? Yeah, you can visualize uh, charge densities. Oh. Um, okay. And so if you want to do like uh, yeah. yeah in general yeah if you want to use gauss view we have to ge generate the cube files mm -hmm. so we can directly do but yeah for vesta you can open okay. the jacka file or baka file okay. directly okay okay uh, you don't have to do That's any conversion because in the past i remember i had to do a conversion mm -hmm. you know, with vesta as well yeah. okay thank you for the comment more questions to the speaker um which orbital do we see here s p or d on which atom are they working? PSP or with of oxygen? Yes, very good. Let's thank uh, Tivan <laughs> once again. So, the uh, next presentation is by Aaron Forde, and he will help us to address one of the. This one? Just. Yes. He will help us to address one of the key challenges. Uh, for periodic systems, the ability of all system of electrons to travel with a specific momentum. For yours, uh, we are about five minutes behind the schedule, but so just try to be quick. So I'll be explaining the purpose of the K points file that we use in VAST. So before going into VAST, we're going to explain what a K point is, basically. So. Comparing small molecules and periodic structures, if we have an acetylene molecule, we can model it as a particle in a box. So if it tries to move, the electron will just kind of bounce back and forth, and here it'll produce a standing wave and have a zero average or zero group velocity. But if you're in a periodic potential well, like a polyacetylene molecule, the electron can uh, tunnel through with these potential barriers here, so it can have a velocity in one direction. So if the electron has velocity, it can have some momentum. And then using the De Broglie relation, we know that momentum is h over lambda. Making use of a convenient change of variables to make it a linear equation, we can change that into the momentum is h bar k, where k is 2 pi over lambda, or the wavelength of the electron. So that is the k that is referring to for k points. So we're essentially plotting electron momentum with our k points file. So as you can see in the fourth row, the 1, 1, 1, that corresponds to plotting one K point and the three 
k point direction is x, y, and z for your periodic directions. So if you change those, like we change the first column into four, they'll plot four k points along the x direction and one along the y and z. So you just have to know which direction your model is periodic in to change the number of k points that are sampled in that direction. And so if the electron has changing momentum, it'll have changing energy as well for each orbital, which will lead to electron or energy dispersion in the periodic crystal. And thankfully, that it's periodic throughout the crystal as well, the dispersion relation. So we just have to sample the smallest repeating unit, which is the Brion zone. And that's where the k-point sample. And then the Brion zone is, corresponds to the lattice vector, or the length. And then the, the wave function solution is the general solution of the Bloch function, and that's what is plotted into to get the energy. So if we have our wave function, we can get our energies. And on the right, that shows just the dispersion relationship for transpoly acetylene. So how do we practically generate the energy dispersion files? So for here, I just plotted the HOMO and the LUMO. And we say we run VAST with the desired amount of k-points. And we inspect our outcar. We'll have a bunch of k-points, like clusters. So for k-point 1, we'll have a k-value and a bunch of energies. And then different k-point, we'll have different energies for the same orbitals. So here I'm plotting the HOMO-LUMO, so 10, 11 orbitals from the output. So first we want to extract the k-points. So the top line just explains how to pull out the k-point files and save them as a kk file, which shows the four k-points that I plotted. And then we want to extract the orbital energies. So grab the 10th orbital energy, save it as k10, and it saves the four corresponding orbital energies for those k-points. And then do the same thing for the 11th to get the LUMO orbital energies. And then we want to merge all those into one file so we can plot them using uh, new plot. And then we have to have them in columns because that's how new plot reads it. So using this top file, that merges them all into an energy dispersion file where we have our k points, homo, and lumo energies. And then we can just write up a little script for new point to plot each of those. And then get the nice little graph that I have on the right showing the energy dispersions for the homo and the lumo. So in summary, for molecules, you only have to plot one k-point since it doesn't have any changing momentum. For periodic structures, you have to plot multiple k-points along your periodic directions. And then k-points give instructions how to plot the k-points so we can <coughs> plot our band structures for the materials. We thank Aaron for uh, the presentation. And questions are very welcome to be thrown at him. Uh, I don't have to ask this question. I, yes, and I'm recording. Whoa, it is on the record who is asking and who is not asking questions. <laughs> okay. Me yeah, again. Okay. So, how do you choose which direction that you vary the k boy values? You mean in the VASP? No, I mean, you have to choose different k boy along a certain direction, right? Mm -hmm. How do you choose that direction? How do you know which direction that you choose? Oh, so, if we go, so if we look here, like, this was correspond to the x-axis. Okay. This column, the second column is the y, and the second column or the third column is the z. Yeah, but but uh, which direction that you, you should go? Right. It depends on the molecule that you're looking at, right? It depends. Oh, you just have to know from when you make it, I guess. So for example, you can choose from the gamma part to x point, or the gamma part to the z part, oh, gamma you mean part the to the l part in the brilliant zone, right? So which direction that you? Oh, this. so that would be the bottom row. So zero, 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 that's the gamma yep. symmetric. And then I'm not too familiar with reciprocal space, so how to switch them around. But you do that with the last row. Uh, let me reformulate the question by Dr. Kong. Are you dealing with two- and three-dimensional periodicity, or you are focusing on one-dimensional periodic systems only? For yeah. this one, it was 1D. Okay. Yeah. More questions? Uh, I do have one. Okay. So. Can you go to your computed uh, dispersion? Yes. So the systems where minimal energy between home and home appears at the zero momentum are named direct gap semiconductors. Mm -hmm. The systems where the minimal energy at non-zero momentum are called indirect gap semiconductors. Do you have here illustration of direct or indirect gap? Uh, from there, it looks like a direct gap. Yeah, but very good. But thank you. <laughs> and, uh, this, uh, the next presentation will be by Whitney Ong. 
and she will continue uh, the aspects of uh, characterizing materials with the uh, VASP software, and she will address the practical way to estimate the gaps, to illustrate what are the gaps, how to compute, and how to process output of VASP. For yours, we are almost in time, thanks to Aaron. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm Whitney, and today I will show you how to plot density of states and molecular orbitals using VASP. So, brief introduction: density of states represents the number of states per interval energy that can be occupied at an inter each energy level. Um, so, if you have a high density of states, means you have many states available for occupation, and if you have a zero density of states, means you don't have any states that can be occupied by electrons. So the molecule I use to optimize all my structures is uh, C4H4 because this is the smallest molecule that I can run with single K point. So after optimizing your structure, you should run a single step job by modifying your in-car file. So first of all, you make a new directory to put everything in there, and then you copy. This is the most important one. You copy your concar file and you rename it to postcard in your in car uh, in your, oh no to your to your new file to, to your new file and then you copy your k points pod car and in car file and then you change make changes to your in car file so first of all you have to make sure your um uh, to make it into a single step job you change the nsw equals to 0 and then if you have different co electronic configuration like cationic or anionic state, you have to state the number of electrons in your system. And if your system is in excited states, you have to change your isomer to negative two and add the line fairway for number of home uh, occupied molecular orbitals multiplied by one, and then you type zero one, and then number of unoccupied molecular orbitals by zero. So here's the example of the in-car file. Your NSW should be zero, and this uh, is added according to your electronic configuration. So after the job is done, uh, the density of states can be plotted, but a uh, few informations are needed. So you need a number of states, you need a number of electrons, number of atoms, and the Fermi energy and alpha and beta energy. So first of all, you, have to you also have to generate a states file. Um, you can get the band energies from the state uh, out car and put it into a states file. And in the states file, it's important to delete the first row uh, because we only want the values and not the wordings. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. So, and then it's important to look at the number of like band, a number of orbitals, and then you look at uh, which interval you want. So, for example, I want a negative nine to like. Uh, one electron volt, just a few above the homo and few below the lumo to um, plot your graph. And then um, you can get the number of electrons from your outcar file. You can also obtain your Fermi and alpha and beta energy from your outcar file. And then you run the script to, um, uh, to generate the density of states and then you answer the questions according to what they want. And then you can set up your parameters of your graph as well. So this will, you can find your energy and for me and alpha and beta. And then if your job is succeeded, you should get this tree line of I am still okay. If it's not okay, well, usually you have one line and then you have error down there. Then whatever new files that is generated will not have any information to make your file. So make sure you have these three lines and then you can move on to the next step. Usually the error comes from you forget uh, when I forgot to delete the first row from the states file. So then you can plot your graph and convert to PDF and then copy to a local computer and view your file. So the results of the results can be very different from like ground states, anion, cation, and excited states. The red the red color shows that the electron uh, the orbitals being occupied by the electrons. So you can see that the in anion state we have extra electrons, so there's like more electrons occupied buying the orbitals, and then in cationic state, we have less electron occupying it. In the excited states, we can see the flipping. 
or like the excited states of uh, the electron occupying the next state instead of the ground state. So if you want to visualize your molecular orbitals instead of um, from the graph, so you also have to have your optimized structure, and then you should make a new directory because it will have um, quite a lot of orbital uh, files being generated. So make a new file, and then um, copy the following files, um, K points, pod car, and one more extra file that you have to copy is the wave car. And then again, copy the con car instead of post car because we want it from the final data, not the initial data. Otherwise, you would not get anything as well. And then in car file can be cop copied from the template in the cluster. And then you also have to change, modify ch some changes in your in-car file. So things to consider is your number of orbitals in the n-bands and the range of orbitals you want. So earlier, I wanted a few above the homo, be a few below the lumo. And uh, yeah, and then I, I just put like negative 9 to 1 electron volt. And then same thing to go with your number of electrons and your firm way if it's in uh, cationic, anionic, or excited state. So this is a, a typical in-car file, uh, in file. So your number of bands and then your um, ENIP should uh, remember to change that. And then your last lines always can add all the changes. And then you will see a many new files can be generated. You can just make both one homo and lumo, but usually you want a few, then you can visualize it in the VAS. You can copy all these files to the local computer and view it using the VAS file. So, uh, brief, brief, uh, go through it briefly using uh, how to use the VAS view. So, in your data tab, you can adjust your isosurface and your see if you want to draw the slice. In the atoms tab, you can adjust the atoms radius in the Bound tab, you can extend or shrink bounds. In the view of zoom, a uh, view tab, you can zoom, rotate, or move the molecules around. And uh, miscellaneous options can be found in the option tab, like changing the atoms color, background, things like that. So this is uh, my, uh, the result of seeing. You can see, you can view different, uh, different orbitals from the homo and lumo state. Uh, yeah, you can view it in the vast view. So in conclusion, four basic files is needed to run the job postcard, in car, podcard, and k-points in dust plots. You need to run a single job step, and you, you also have to <coughs> adjust it based on your electronic configuration. And in molecular orbitals visualization, the most important thing is uh, you need an additional wave car file in there, and you re must remember to copy concar file instead of postcard. Questions? Let's compete. Uh, presentation is open for discussion. Levi is uh, on slide six. You say you can just hit six enter. You say number of homo times one zero one number of lumo. Are you adding two additional states to your band? Number of bands? Oh, sorry, minus one. Okay. The, the total should come to the number of molecular orbitals. Good idea. Um, Dr. Kung, can you, can you get back to where you saw the anion, cation, and excited state? Uh, the density of state, yes. Uh, so, uh, when we look at this, how do we know it's anion, or cation, or excited state? Uh, you have some simple you know, tips on how to look at this density of state in general. So how, how do we know that it's ground state? How do we know that an ion? Or how do we know it's cation? Let me reformulate the question of uh, <laughs> Dr. Kahn. If we close this information and we do not know what are the labels, can one recognize and we, we know only that there is the same molecule in different configurations, ground, cat anion, cation, and lowest excited. Can you point out and explain which of them is, uh, what is the signi typical signatures of anion, cation, and excited state? So this one will definitely be excited states because of the different... Swap, swapping the swap, of the, the of population. The, uh, for anion, the electron 
uh, occupation will be like towards <laughs> the right and mm -hmm. the cation will be towards the left. If you look at the energy, this is like in negative 16 and this is like in negative 2. The ground state will be like in the middle, like negative 4, negative 3. So, so the signature is the occupation, right? So see whether which state is occupied or empty, right? So for example, in the excited state, you have the empty, the empty state below an occupied state. So that means you remove one other strong below. So the Very good. More questions? If no, let's thank Whitney once again. And the next presenter is Zachary Gerhardt. I am learning how to pronounce his name for the last couple of years. Ah, and no the prison... Huh? No worries, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> so, his presentation is, has a key importance because he opens a door. He opens a door into the world of spin-polarized models, in the world of magnetic materials. For you. Rest of the world. <laughs> All right, so I'm Zach, and I will be talking about how to uh, look at open shell systems and VASP, specifically their density of states. Okay, so what's an open shell system? Well, we all know what valence shells are, and if they are filled, they'll have spin pairing, right? Well, if we do not have spin pairing, we only have one electron occupancy per orbital. In the case of oxygen, we now have an open shell system. So, uh, transition metals also are open shells. Um, for instance, I'm using uh, the aqua metal, uh, transition metal complexes, uh, or I should say hexa-aqua transition metal complexes. And the cool thing is, I mean, there is a, a schematic of the octahedral geometry of a hexa-aqua transition metal complex, but they also have different colors that correspond to their transition energies, and these are DDT uh, transitions. So, I'm going to be using specifically the titanium 3 plus uh, as a model for generating these density of states. So the biggest difference here, other than acquiring your four fundamental files, is what you do in your in-car file. And so there, you can actually adjust what the spin state is. And just to remind you, the spin state is two times what the summation of all the half-integer uh, spins are, plus one. And those half integer spins, remember, that's the number of uh, single electrons, basically, so it's not spin paired. Uh, so for instance, for oxygen, it's two, right? Because you have two times one half, one times two, two plus one, three. It's a triplet, aha, fantastic. In our case, we are do doing titanium three plus. We only have one uh, unpaired electron, so it's going to be a double. You can change the oxidation state because otherwise it would just treat it as a neutral metal uh, complex and then this would be wrong. So that's the number of electrons and specifically the number of valence electrons. So you don't have to count core electrons here. And so that totals up to 49. Okay, so go ahead, you have your files now, you run VASP, you get a whole bunch of joy. And then if we look into the outcar file, uh, you will see now that your energies for the generated molecular orbitals are now um, split into diff two different spins. You have uh, spin component one and spin component two. And so, up, down, basically. And what you should notice is that the occupancy of the homos and the lumos are different. So for the spin up, we have occupancy up to 25 orbitals. Spin down, we have occupancy only up to 24. This makes sense because we have a unpaired electron. Okay, so now what we want to do is actually go ahead and generate our density of states. So we need to pull that spin component energies out of our out car, place them in these states up and states down files. You want to remove, you know, all the text so that we actually can read the file properly. Um, and then you generate your density of states by using the script, uh, the address does up or down, Fill, follow the, uh, the prompts, so number of states, your energy range of your orbitals, um, Fermi, alpha, beta, magnitudes, all that fun stuff. If it all checks out, it should be okay. And then, um, for completion, you want to plot it, right? So plot it with new plot, uh, do the file transfer with PDF, and then 
downloaded. So this uh, is the density of states plot for titanium 3 plus, covering basically the whole range. Uh, what you'll notice is that it's pretty symmetric where they are evenly populated as far as the orbitals are concerned. But once we uh, get to the point where the orbitals are not equally populated, we start to see differences in their energies. Um, if we zoom in on that one little uh, piece, we can kind of correlate the population of those orbitals to what we may actually understand of their frontier molecular orbitals by either actually doing the calculation uh, ab initio or you know, symmetry group theory rules. The cool thing is, is that what you see here is that uh, it is observed and predicted that the octahedral electronic configuration actually undergoes symmetry lowering such that the total energy of the molecule is lowered. And as a result, the geometry is changed. So I showed you an octahedral complex earlier. That is not its real geometry because the lowest energy electronic state is in a lower geometric um, model or orientation, orientation. And so what you can also see is that, hey, I don't have triply degenerate orbitals here. I have basically a single orbital, two presumably doubly degenerate orbitals, and then the two non-degenerate uh, orbital, orbitals as well. And then you can actually convince yourself whether, whether or not these are debased orbitals by actually plotting their uh, partial charge densities. And as you can see, if you squint, <laughs> that these are all the uh, molecular orbitals. Um, and then one take home thing to remind you is that these are all one electron molecular orbitals, right? Because you have your spin up and your spin down contributions. And so uh, the reality here is that you have to use spin polarized computations if you're going to look at open shell systems. Otherwise, you will not get anything that's remotely close to real. Um, also, you can look at the partial charge densities to kind of get an idea of what do my molecular orbitals look like and what are the possible transitions that can arise from them. Questions? But thanks, Zachary, your nice presentation. And questions are very well. Uh, which means everyone is happy running spin polarized jobs and there are no questions. Um, you were showing the orbitals. Yes. And those are for spin up. Yes. What is your instinct? If one plots uh, orbitals for spin down, will they be exactly the same or slightly changed or drastically changed? Um, like, what are expectations? Can the orbital of the same symmetry, like, with, with the symbols, repeat the same pattern of for up and down? So, intuitively, you would think that yes, they should be mirror images of each other. Um, one thing you can realize is that if you look at the dxy here, or the b2g orbital for the spin up, is of lower energy than what one would assume is the b2g orbital in the spin down. And that's likely due to it being occupied. Um, so if we actually had these, if I actually had two electrons, it may be more mirror imaged. So the reality is, yes, they'll be very similar, but their energy ordering may not be the same due to occupancy. OK, uh, more questions? I have one more. Fantastic. <laughs> so here you are showing lines. Yes. Discrete energies. And yes. here you are showing profiles. Yes. What is the connection? So the connection here is this is basically rigid. It is at the equilibrium point or the equilibrium geometry of the molecule. Here there is some thermal degrees of freedom that is taken into consideration. Very good. Yep. Yeah. But thanks, Zach. Oh, um, <laughs> What about, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go what ahead. about uncertainty? Yes, because we are at very low temperatures uh, in these calculations, if I recall, because we're not looking at um, room temperature calculations. At least this did not take into consideration room temperature calculations. So the uncertainty is intrinsic to this. OK, now let's finally thank uh, Zach. And um, we, uh, the next presenter, please come up and set up your presentation, is Seth Adrian, and he's opening another door for us.
By now, we were focusing primarily on ground state or artificially populated excited states, but we were not looking on the response of the material to the external perturbation, such as photoexcitation. So this will open a door to explaining how material responds to light, light to matter interaction. For example, as you said, my name is Todd Adrian. Um, so we're going to be looking at the light to matter interaction. Um, so for this to actually occur, there has to be a transition dipole uh, moment to where it has to occur when the light hits. Um, and the way we mathematically show this is you have um, your ground state and your excited states and the dipole operator um, is in between them and that this all comes from symmetry um, basis and as long as you get a non-zero product um, that you have a transition dipole um, and in uh, very basic terms like something you would teach to freshmen in chemistry is your L quantum number has to go plus or minus one um, basically um, and here I just show you know light coming in you have an absorption that is roughly equal to the energy of the light. All right, so to develop your input files for generating these spectra, um, you make the states file like half a dozen people have already talked about, and you VI it. Um, and out of this, you need the number of states to uh, for later. Um, you copy the states into an energy pop file. That's just how the script works, is it needs an energy pop file. Um, and then you have to make this new file called vi input underscore overlap. You go one, and then you next line you have number of states, and then the last line you put another one. And then you run the script os underscore dip dipole underscore v3, which makes the os strength file. Um, and out of that, you need the number of transitions. So inside this OS strength file, there's some pretty interesting things. Um, the first one is the I, or the first column here is the I. That is um, the first molecular orbital where the electrons originally reside on. And then you go to your J, which is your second electron orbital, or your empty orbital where the electrons go to. So in this case, it goes from six to seven. Um, and then your third column here is oscillator strength. The oscillator strength is the probability of the calculated optical transition. Um, and the oscillator strength is related to the transition dipole moment um, by a constant times the square of that transition dipole moment. And um, here you have your energy difference. Um, your, uh, it is, this is the occupancy, so F sub I is, there's two electrons in that orbital. F sub J, there's no electrons in that orbital, so it's going from I to J. Um, again, and then here's your um, coordinates or to describe the orbitals. Um, and then you generate a plot, which is using the script bin spectrum, and you have to answer the questions, number of transitions. 36 in the, in the case of, for me. Um, and then you say, how big a plot do you want? You know, you can go 0.1 to 10, you know, to get a fairly large range. And then you enter your width of each line and you tell, hey, my homo is in um, number six. It runs a script, it generates this file, or it, it generates a file that you can pull out and work on in Excel or whatever your favorite. Um, system is, but we can use GNU plot um, to plot it, and that makes an SPE.ps file. Um, you can include, after the SPE, an underscore nanometer if you are a traditional one, or a traditional um, absorbent spectroscopist, and you want to be able to see it in nanometers, um, and it's easier to, for you to think about. Um, and then you convert to PDF and you get that bad boy right over there. Okay, but thank you. Is everyone happy? No, Levi is not happy, Ernie is not happy. Please go for On it. On slide three, your third bullet. Slide three. 
Oh, sorry, slide four. This one doesn't have. Uh, your third bullet, you say one number of states, one. What if you have, let's say, 2,000 states in your system that vary over at least 10, if not like 100 TV, and you only want to plot the states near the band gap, what do you need to do? Um, I'm sure probably just modify your states file. I think this number has to, because when you run this script, it pulls the things out of the states file, or the energy pot file actually. So if you don't have the same number, and it uses this file, so if you don't have the same number here as you have there, it's going to be angry with you. Okay, so um, your answer to Levi's question is that if you want to narrow your window of orbitals, you um, trim your states file. Yeah. But then you're saying that this input overlap should match this yeah. energy pop. So which numbers should, you, should be plugged into here and there if this uh, states is trimmed? If it starts not from one, but from 100. So then go 100? Yes, yes, very good. Uh, more questions? Yeah, just so when, when it goes through a transition, does it move both the electrons or just the one? Um, I'm not sure how it calculates it. I, I think it's both, but I'm not sure how it, it, it's actually calculating it in this. I, I think it basically is like Whitney's excited state where it moves. And uh, point on your brain cat, and then point finger on arrow. <laughs> so it's just probability of transition. Okay, so it's, it's probability. Oh, okay. okay, yeah. Uh, I do have one question more. Sure. Uh, can you go to the table of uh, the uh, transition dipoles? Yes, here. And you have named these three last columns coordinates. Are you sure or you want to correct it, yourself? That's not the right word. I don't remember the right How word. How are these three numbers uh, connected with uh, transition dipole? Um, is it the uh, orientation along which the transition dipole is changing? Yes. Uh, is transition num uh, for given pair of orbitals? Yes. Uh, would you agree that transition I'm given two options. Transition dipole is a number or it is a vector of three components? It's a vector. Where are these components in this file? Yes. Let's thank Fess for, for the presentation. And the next uh, presentation is by uh, Levi Lustrum. So his talk is special in, um, in the following circumstances. Uh, in some sense, he summarizes three previous talks. What he is going to present will be connected to a talk by Whitney, because he is going to scroll through different electronic configurations. His talk is connected to Zach, because he is going to look on the spin resolved calculations. And his talk is connected to the presentation by Seth, because he is going to look on the uh, response of the system to the uh, light. So different configurations, spin and light. Floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to look at this model just like Zach. Uh, it's titanium with six oxygens, uh, six water. So um, since we need spin polarized calculation, um, first we need to figure out our multiplicity and just like um, in the previous ones, you look at the number of unpaired, and you pretty much take the number of unpaired electrons, add one, that's your multiplicity. So for uh, all paired, it's single, uh, singlet. If you have one unpaired, it's doublet. If you have two, uh, two unpaired, it's triplet, and so forth. Um, and this is just like if you have low spin or high spin, because this is a octahedral, and this is a splitting, so we can either have if we have all four uh, d electrons, it can be um, a triplet, or if we excite it, then it can be a septet or whatever five is. Um, so to get spin polarized, you need to do this i spin equals two. If you do not include this, it will say have everything paired. 
Um, if you want to force your system to be in like a triplet state, you can say up down equals a, where for singlet a is zero because it's taking the difference between the number of alpha and beta. So to get from singlet to triplet, you say two because then you have um, two more in um, not paired. So from this, we can uh, take our single point calculation, get our out car, and I wrote a script because I don't like answering questions. So I did this dot spin dot sh, and it, I'll summarize what it does. It gets the uh, bands, then it calculates the window that we're going to plot it at. It plots the dos, which is here. And then it also calculates the spin polarized absorption spectra. And then it plots it. So the top here is uh, the alpha beta components. The bottom is the average between it. And if you want to look into this script more, just open it up. But with the time restraints, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail on the script. So if we go to the singlet, as I said kind of before, when we have all four electrons, it wants to be in a triplet state. So between when we have the neutral compound, uh, complex, the singlet, if you don't specify, it will take the lowest energy configuration. And due to Hund's rule, it's not going to be two paired and then have an empty one. So for this one, it's pretty much the same spectra. But when we go to the first ionizer, we take a uh, electron away, then they start to deviate, and right now it's a doublet, and we can see that from the DOS, there is a uh, occupied state very close to the unoccupied for the spin up, but the spin down, there's a huge gap, and this will be constant, and we can see if we were to chop it off at like four electron volts, we would not see any contribution due to the spin down electrons. And so it's pretty much just the spin up that is contributing to the absorption. So then if we go to the quartet, or if we have uh, three electrons non-paired, the trend is pretty much the same, where the gap with spin down is too big to see it within a reasonable window. But if we go to the second ionized, where we'll go back to singlet or triplet, because in this case, again, it, for singlet for this molecule isn't the best. But we can see, since we're computational, we can force it to do whatever we want. Um, we see that there is a very bright transition right away. And then this entire spectra has components due to spin up and spin down because our unoccupied or homo is right next to the lumos, which is interesting and then if we go to triplet we see just like in the doublet case that the spin down is way into the uh, absorption and we only see spin up and then if we go to the third the third case we see pre similar case just like the second the first ionized where we have doublet and quartet where most of it only comes from the spin-up electrons. So in conclusion, uh, multiplicity is pretty much the number of unpaired plus one. Um, when you have higher multiplicity, you tend to have one spin component dominating the spectra at low energy. Um, this dot underscore spin dot sh, I think it's very helpful because you don't have to do anything. You just have to hit it and it does everything for you. So I think you right. What is um, community contribution to script development? Oh and this is in the bin. And his presentation is open for discussion or hard questions if someone wants to give him a hard time. Okay. Or if something was not clear in the presentation, it is a chance to catch the speaker. Yes. You called high spin on slide three. You called high spin and excited state. Is that true? No, it's just different configuration. It's how much magnetic field you have, kind of.
Or you can get it with magnetic field. Uh, there was a question from... Uh, yes. Zach? So which spin configuration tends to be favored in the ground state? Typically, uh, I would believe low spin. That always true. I have no idea. <laughs> let me reformulate re question by Zach. Yes. How does the ground state configuration, low or high, relates to crystal field splitting? Um, if crystal field splitting is low, then it will be in high spin. If it's high, then it's be in low spin. Good. More questions to Levi? I have a couple. Okay. So, can you go to your spectrum? Which one? Any. Any. So, uh, when we were hearing presentation by Seth, he was showing that he's uh, finding the expectation value of, of uh, transition dipole moment, and he's setting up a table with oscillator strengths, mm -hmm. discrete correspondence between energy and oscillator strengths. And then he was converting it into continuous spectrum. Yes. Here you are showing three lines, yes. and you're not showing where are they coming from. Can you explain what are you doing? So we pretty much do the same thing as if we have non-polarized calculation, but in this case we can go from uh, any state that is singly occupied to another state that is also singly occupied, but with the opposite spin. So when we calculate the, the uh, uh, oscillator strengths, the file has a lot more combinations that can occur. So these ones are only from singly occupied to not on occupied states. Do you observe spin forbidden transitions? Um, that would, you would have to open up the code that does this, and I didn't open the code because I didn't do it. And I think if you wanted to look at spin forbidden, you would need some perturbation to the crystal field, and I didn't do any perturbation, so. Let's dig deeper, because I, <laughs> I feel a little gap in our knowledge as a group. So you label here spec up and spec down. What yes. does it mean? Where are they coming from? So you promote a single electron from an orbital that spin up to an empty orbital. So spin that's with spin? Spin up. Okay, so spin is conserved. Yes. So Levi assumes that spin is a good quantum number and he is not flipping spin. Yes. Continue. So spin down is the same, but it's down. And if you wanted to do a, a absorption that was a spin flip, so if you have a beta and you want to go to alpha, those are also calculated, but I didn't plot we, it. We do not have it. Okay. Yes. So, do you have analog of oscillator strength file, same as this did? Yes. How many? Uh, two. How do you get them? You Please teach us as a class. You open. You could go to the bin, and then there's a directory called spin, and there are two Fortran codes that you can run. One is spin up, one is spin down. You run it, you get the two, spec uh, the two oscillator spin files. Good. Do they use the same input files or slightly different input files? They use the same, with states being up and states being down. So you have two replicas yes. of uh, orbital yes. energies. One for up, another for down. Yes. And you tell that you were planning to show it, but there was limited time. Yes. Good. If you're worried about it, open up the DAS spin, and it will explain it, hopefully. Or come talk to me. <laughs> so do you know the selection rules for spin, uh, forbidden and spin allowed transitions? Any criteria for spin allowed and spin forbidden? I don't recall from f physics, chemical physics, yes. One. Plus or minus one. Yeah. Uh, is, there, is there a name associated with this selection rule? 
Uh, is it like spin like allow uh, port spin up goes up to spin up or yeah. the like yeah. kind of if you have spin over coupling you uh -huh. can you can do a lot more things but mm -hmm. in these codes I do not believe we're spin over coupling. What was the question? No. Okay, <laughs> let's uh, let Levi to relax a little. Let's thank him for setting up the questions. And we have, uh, we are very behind the schedule and we have three talks more. Now we are opening another door. We are going to another challenge for characterizing materials. We are going to the barriers of reactions. We are going to breaking and forming chemical bonds. And uh, we are using ab initio molecular dynamics as a tool to go through this uh, type of challenges. First presentation is by Samuel Brown, <laughs> and he will be the first to open the door in the world of molecular dynamics. Hi, thanks. Yep, my name is Sam Brown. Um, so I'm going to be doing some modeling molecular dynamics at or above room temperature. So basic of my talk basis will be um, setting the thermostat, how to increase the temperature on your models. Um, so for any model or anything we do in VASP, uh, as this has been mentioned several times before, you need four different files, you need the POSCAR, POTCAR, K-Points, and NCAR. And then to model um, molecular dynamics, there's like three different things that we'll need to do. We'll have to have a um, geometry optimized model, then we'll have to set the thermostat of that model, and then we'll have to do some molecular dynamics. And for each one of these three things, we'll have to have these four input files. So we're starting from we're assuming we have a geometry optimized model, and now we're going to create the heating model. Uh, so if, in order to do that, we need to create those four models from before. So we need to copy in um, our Kant car and make that a post car, and, and then um, copy over a, a pot car, which is the potentials, get the K points, and then we need to open up the in car, which as we all know, this is what actually does the, the different operations. So we're going to look into a little bit more of the the in car. Uh, so this is the in car, and this is where we can kind of set the temperature that we want. So you probably can't see this, but right here it says T E B E G, and that's the temperature beginning. And then right below that it says T E ending, and that'll be the ending temperature of your dynamics. So for this one, I have it set, or it's initially start at 300 degrees, which is about room temperature, um, but we can change that to 3,000 or whatever we want. Um, then over here we have NSW, which that's the number of steps. We can also change that. So for like this example, I set it from 300 to 50 just for computational um, reasons. And then below that we have the time step between each one of those. Um, so when we run that, we get uh, different files. Um, we got this from the lab, the, the OSCAR files. So this shows the different iterations and the ways the ions move throughout the um, the optimization. And for each one of these we have a different uh, temperature and then um, so we can we can plot using new plot the temperature for these different time steps or iterations. So looking at this you can see uh, for the first one I did, I did one at 300 degrees, then one at 1000 degrees, and then one at 3000. So it's kind of hard to see but we have some pretty strong variations right off the bat which then it starts to level off around 300. Same thing, there's a lot of variations right off the bat, and then it levels off to about the temperature we want, and then again at 3,000. Um, so then after that, once we have, um, we ran that model, then we're going to put that into a molecular dynamics um, program. So again, we have the same thing where we're going to, um, we'll make a new directory, which has been shown before, so for uh, molecular dynamics. Then we're going to copy over our four files that um, what we just did in the last model. So we're going to copy over the con car into a post car, um, copy the K points pot car, and then we're going to um, copy a, a new in car from the in car bin. And uh, we'll look at that briefly. Uh, so for this, we have um, this is the in car. There's another TEBEG, which is um, initially set at 300. And we're going to change that um, to whatever temperature you want. So if you had your model initially at the thermostat, you want to change that to 3,000 again. This um, isn't, this is for the temperature of the electrons, not the actual model. So that's something to note. And then um, again down here, you have the number of steps you can do. So after we adjust the in-car, then you have your four files again. 
you can um, run that and get your output. And then um, you can view this um, watching a movie, which I think uh, JBED's going to go over a little bit more detail. Uh, I tried a couple different ways to do this. Um, some didn't work. Um, I worked with Molden. You can use um, the command xdat to xyz to create a, a movie. And then uh, you can view this in Molden, or you can look at like JMOL, um, VWD will look at this. So um, in one of my models, I create, looked at it in VWD, and then you can export that as a movie, which is what I have here. I think I can get it to play. And then you can just get it to dance around. How exciting. Yeah, very exciting. <laughs> uh, is there other conclusions? That was it. OK. <laughs> So, presentation by Sam is open for discussion and questions. Uh, I do have one, but I will ask after. I was just going to say, uh, is there ever a reason to not have T beginning and T uh, ending be the same? Or temp begin, temp begin? If you were maybe wanting to ramp up slowly, do like an annealing type of process. Um, so this one, we just threw it down on the hot plate or whatever and then spiked it really high. But like some experiments, experiments that you might want to slowly ramp up and keep at temperature and then come back down. Good. And uh, at the board, you've told that um, random variations of temperature. Is there a single word to bring together all of those? If something suddenly spikes one side, another side, it's not a scientific question, it's more a linguistic question. How do you call it? Something fluctuating? Yes. Say that again. Fluctuation of oh. energy. Okay. Thank you for <laughs> presenting Thanks. this stuff. Let's thank Sam once again. And next presentation is continuation of our moving forward toward the world of chemical reactions, bone breaking, bone formation, by Mohammed Abu Javed, who will uh, show us more details and more background of the molecular dynamics. For example. Thank you, Dimitri. Thanks, Sam, actually, it's almost a repetition of previous talk. So this is actually math intensive topics, but I'm not going to talk about any math. I'm just going to repeat all step, how we'll calculate the heating and molecular dynamics and also continuation of job. So as I said, for a box job, we need to for uh, if file, postcard, cap point, and podcard. And uh, <clears throat> so after the all si uh, each cycle, box write their geometry in the concar file as a postcard format. So any for any purpose, if we want to continue the job, we need to write a postcard file from the concar of the previous job. So and. Other thing is the same as a pot uh, <coughs> car and cap point is the same thing. But if we want to continue an optimization job or the same thing, so we can use the web car file in the new directory that will save our some time. Or, or if we don't the web car file, buffs will create the web car file again. And then just run the job. That's all for a continuation job. For heating system, and in all calculation, Gaussian job calculation or geometry optimization, we do that calculation in zero degree Kelvin. But for real, real system, if you want to compare practical, we need to move our system to higher temperature to put the high temperature, uh, some kinetic energy. So that's why the, we need the heating, uh, heating of the system. And Sam already described this all step. We need to copy the conquer file to the new directory as a postcard, and we need to use the cap point and port curve, but we don't we shouldn't be use a uh, web car file from the previous job because change of the kinetic energy, the web function also changes so they will create the new and we need to copy the incar file from this bean directory is a Dimitri directory from the bean in car in car hit that uh, in car the in car file use as a input file for the work jobs and then we need to run the job and in the next one i just put an example of the inter file we need to this is the whole team this is the time step in the picosecond sorry frame to second units and this is the number of step if we want 100 steps so it's going to be 15 and uh, frame to second 
and we need to put the temperature to beginning and T back and T end, T E end. I put it as a 2000 degree Celsius, sorry, in Kelvin, not Celsius. And this is showing a graphical uh, presentation of the fluctuation of the temperature, as I said. In the first step, they put the 2000 temperature, 2000 degree Kelvin, 2000 Kelvin. But when we put the kinetic energy, this system can, this energy can be going to accumulate some potential, potential energy, and then kinetic, uh, uh, kinetic energy is go down. That's why temperature is going down. And then the system will be heat again. So temperature will fluctuate. If we run the enough step, we will get a minimum fluctuation of energy, and we will get a stable uh, heat energy. And then we, if we hit the, uh, this system, then we use that geometry for molecular dynamics. For to get the molecular dynamics, the same thing. Just we need to concur file as a postcode, and we need to use the different incur file. This name as the incur MD in the bean directory. And well, and in after this, after this one, this all step, all frame, I mean all temp, uh, all step will be saved as a x dead curve file then we will extract this all step uh, in xyz coordinates as in by you by running this script x dead to xyz dot is a poly script to get a file name movie dot xyz movie dot xyz will contain all steps in a xyz format with energy and the time step as a frame uh, then if we open this file in the VM, I use the VMD. We can use other software too, like uh, VSTA or. Then in VMD, we can create an animation by this one. This VM, we can manipulate these graphics and everything else. But main position is we need to get an animation. Then it will make a, make a each frame, and then by if we have an add-on by adding this all frame that will give us a movie like this one this is not very exotic because this 2000 temperature is not enough to do any breakdown or anything else that's why it's showing this just some vibration thank you that's why oh, we have one more slide oh okay i thought that we are running out of time so this is just showing the mathematical equation how do you calculate this uh, dynamics first uh, by using the newton's law of motions we can know this by this one um, change of the position with the time, I mean this is called acceleration, it's related with the force, and this force will really can be uh, related to the gradi change of gradient of the potential energy. And then finally, this potential energy can be accelerated on the position of these ions. Okay, well, thank uh, Jabba for the presentation. Any questions? Um, will the dynamics change if you change electronic configuration? Will the, huh? Sorry. Will the trajectory change if you make it anion, cation, or excited state? Yeah. Yes. Let's thank Javid once again. So we have the last presentation by Brendan Disrad, who will give us most important part of molecular dynamics. How do you visualize? present and upload it to YouTube channel if uh, time allows. So it is most important practical steps that we need in uh, uh, completing of our research projects. Floor is yours. All right. Um, videos. We've started on it a little bit with the last couple people, but uh, we'll get a little bit more deep into it now. Um, the couple ways I'm going to go over here are uh, Molden, which has the benefit of being on the cluster, so you don't have to uh, install anything yourself. And uh, VMD, which you have to install yourself, and in some cases, like if you are using Windows machines, you might need to install uh, VideoMock um, to actually produce your videos as well. All right, so the first thing you have to do is you have to take your uh, molecular dynamics outputs and uh, convert them over into the uh, movie.xyz file, which is easy, just with the x that to xyz um, command call. And then we get to go and start generating. Um, this first one here is our, uh, our look at Molden. When you open it up, you get you know something that looks like this. And there's three big uh, points of interest that uh, we can get from the Molden interface. This first one down here, the draw mode, 
um, lets you select what your model is going to look like. It starts out in the, the stick sort of configuration, um, but you can choose whatever you prefer. Um, then there's this uh, movie button there, which will, um, and that, that whole section lets you uh, navigate through the, the actual dynamics and all the different frames of calculation um, for your model. And then the uh, red highlighted button is a toggle whether you uh, actually like record each frame itself. So if you hit the, the red button and then the green button, you will record and print into your directory every uh, frame of the calculation. After that, uh, you need to condense all those frames into one uh, continuous file, which is really small. Um, but the long line of code you can find in the advice um, for making a movie in the, the advice bin. Just copy it down and uh, put your, your file name at the end. Yeah. Um, now to VMD, which uh, has more options to it. Um, first, you have to start out with uh, uploading your uh, molecule into VMD itself. So you go new molecule, you know, browse to find wherever your uh, movie.xyz is, you know, saved, loaded up, and then um, you get to choose your representation. And um, there's, you know, a dozen or more different uh, drawing configurations. I like the CPK because it's, you know, normal ball and stick model. Um, then we get to start to actually make the movie here under extensions and visualization. There's the movie maker. You just click it. It'll bring up this screen here. Um, you have to set two things uh, right away. The working directory, which is where your files are going to be saved, um, and the name of the file which you're going to be saving. Um, then if you uh, go to the movie settings and go down, you can select um, different types of the uh, the movie that you'd produce and then you make the movie and we'll get to the different types uh, in a second here but when you make the movie um, your computer might not recognize the video mock which you have installed if that happens you just say oh it's it's okay I know where it is because you're good at computers and you can go into the uh, directory in your programs file and specify uh, for it and then it'll bring up video mock and you can just hit start and it'll record it or you can change the video format um, and then there you go you got lots of different ones here's the the molden one it's a uh, just a simple trajectory starts at the beginning and slowly goes to the end that's the same as this um, one made in VMD but the VMD one's a little quicker a little smoother um, the trajectory rock, which is one of the options in VMD, will play just like the trajectory, but once it reaches the end, it plays in reverse to get back to your starting point. And then, um, like this rock and roll format here, isn't actually dynamics at all. It just like um, kind of moves the camera around the first frame, and that's it. Okay, good thing, bro. And are there any questions to the practical aspects of creating movies? Um, last chance? No? What is the difference between force field molecular dynamics and ab initial molecular dynamics? Um, force field doesn't allow bonds to be formed or broken? Yes. Correct. Let's thank uh, Brendan once again for our uh, presentation. And uh, with this, th uh, thank you. I would like to uh, conclude that through series of the nicely prepared presentations and discussion session, we were able to expand our abilities to model materials from just chemical models to the spin polarized models, magnetic materials, to the models that break bonds and to the models that are periodic in space. So with this soft software, we can model anything, solid, liquid, gas, 
their interfaces. And uh, I would like to announce a great success and hope that you've learned a lot from each other. And uh, with this, we will Your be able will to be go to the small research projects as a part of the course. Lecture number 23 is finished. And uh, let me announce the end of the meeting. Adjourn. I'm thanking all of the speakers. Thank you.